All right. Hi, guys. I was uh, talking to uh, Analog Andy, who you must know from YouTube. And if you don't, you should look him up because, uh, because he has a really nice channel. And um, I don't do videos very much, but uh, we got to talk about color negative inversions, uh, which is something that many people struggle with. And Andy was uh, playing uh, a little bit with uh, color negative scans. So uh, I sort of barged in and said, well, this is how I do inversions. And he said, you should do a video on that. And uh, well, he talked me into it. So uh, uh, let's see how that works. Um, so the main thing that um, I ran into when I started doing uh, color negative inversions or scanning uh, about 20 years ago was that basically all my photos looked like crap. <laughs> and uh, the problem is twofold. So on the one hand, you know, getting the right color balance is challenging. And on the other hand, um, getting consistency, you know, if you scan like 36 frames from a 35 millimeter camera, uh, how do you get the color balance the same on every frame or at least comparable? Um, so um, to be frank, for a while I just gave up and shot color chromes, you know, <laughs> positive film. Uh, but in the end, you know, I really like printing in the dark rooms or I like to work with uh, color negative film. And that means that if I want to do something digitally with that as well, I need to scan and invert. Um, so instead of using some kind of automated uh, color inversion, which is what scanning software generally gives you, I do it manually. And the reason I do it manually is because of this consistency problem. You know, if you scan color negative and you let the scanner handle all the colors, then basically what you get is, uh, well, it's inconsistent and, and uh, it's very difficult to fix once it goes wrong, at least in my experience. So I'd rather do it manually. And doing it manually does mean that you have to start with something that's sort of as neutral as possible, uh, sort of like a raw file in uh, digital photography. And uh, I'm using a, a very old Epson flatbed scanner. It's a 4990. And I think it's the same scanner that Andy actually uses, so that's kind of appropriate. Um, so I'm going to show you guys how I do this, so how I scan my film and then how I uh, invert the colors and balance the colors in, in order to get something that looks sort of natural. Um, so starting with the scanning, actually what you see uh, in the screen um, is something that I already scanned, but I'll, I'll walk you through the scanning settings um because there's there's a there's a couple of tricks that you need to know about so i'm using epson scan so the stock software that my scanner came with like 20 years ago uh, it hasn't been updated in ages it runs fine on windows 10 uh so i'm very happy with it and you see i'm running it in professional mode uh if you look here because that that's the only mode that gives you any meaningful settings at all um so selected a film as, uh, as the media type. And then um, this is the first important setting is I'm scanning as if it were positive film. So even though I'm working with color negative, I'm actually telling the scanner to treat it as slides or as color positive film. The next very important setting is the color depth, um, which I keep at 48 bits, which is the highest it goes. And this is because we need to do a lot of adjustments later on. So we need all the color space that we can get. Uh, so I leave this at 48. Resolution for the example doesn't really matter. I, I put it here at 300, which is very, you know, it's insanely low for scanning uh, uh, small format uh, negatives, but uh, you know, ignore that. If you want to scan at like 2400 DPI, just, just do that. Um, and then the final and perhaps most important setting is, is actually right here. If I click the configuration button, I get this little pop-up window and it says this top, this tab that has color settings in it. And generally it's, uh, it's set by default to color control, which is a very nice way of saying, well, the scanning software is going to interpret colors for you. And this is exactly what we don't want. So I put it on no color correction at all. Uh, so no profiling whatsoever, just put it no color correction. And there's one slider that sort of it kind of bugs me because it's the only sort of auto-correct it still has, which is the auto, auto exposure level. And I just keep it at the center value uh, and I never touch it, to be frank. And you know, this has served me well. So the no color correction option is very, very important. And if you select that, and I'm going to click OK to confirm, uh, you see that the adjustments that you generally have in the Epson scanner, uh, scanner software, they sort of disappear, they're grayed out, uh, which is good. 
because it means that we cannot touch the colors in Epson scan, which is fine. I just want to, you know, grab in the data and then process it further on um, in my image editing, editing software. On the right hand uh, side of the screen, you can see this is a preview and it's actually something that I've been scanning earlier today, which is uh, a couple of strips of color negative. And you see how they come out. So it's pretty flat and of course it looks very brown because, you know, color negative is basically a brown or uh, sort of orange base. And then the image is laid on, laid on top of that. And uh, it looks kind of crappy, but this is good. You know, it's a very flat image. Uh, and this is something that we can work with. Um, I'm not going to scan it right now because I've already done that. So I'm going to go back to uh, my image editing uh, software, which is uh, GIMP. I use GIMP instead of Photoshop because, you know, GIMP is open source. It's free to use. And at some point I just stopped using Photoshop. Um, what I'm going to show you, you know, you can do the same in Photoshop. It doesn't really matter. There's some couple of uh, other programs you can do the same thing in, I guess. Uh, but I've only used uh, uh, Photoshop and GIMP for this. Um, and with GIMP, so I imported the, uh, uh, the image files, so the, the, the negatives. And as you can see, I scanned uh, as many negatives on uh, uh, the, the platen as I could in one go. So I scanned just everything. And if I scan 36 frames uh, of a roll of film, I usually, you know, paste them together into, you know, one big file and then do the color balancing that way. Uh, the reason why I'm working with several images on this at the same time on my monitor is that it makes it easier for me to color balance in a sort of neutral way. Uh, if I had just one image to focus on, I would probably be you know, bias towards the balance of that particular image. And if it happens to be shot on very cool or in very warm light, I will bias toward, you know, uh, in that direction. And I want to prevent that. I want to sort of have a neutral balance that is consistent uh, across all the photos, at least on the same roll of film. So I'm, you know, looking at, in this case, what is it? You know, 24 frames could have been 36. All right, so I've got my image here and I'm um, basically the only thing I'm going to do here is adjust the curves in order to get uh, an inversion and a color balancing more or less in one go. And um, so the curves dialog, we can find that here on the colors and on curves, it's located somewhere else in Photoshop, but the, the, the same general principle applies. And uh, conveniently, the curves dialog gives me some insight into the histogram as well. So I know how the tones are distributed across, uh, you know, the, the black to white scale. And um, you can see that here. But what this does not give us yet is control over color. And we need that. So um, by default, GIMP uh, enters the curve dialog uh, in just, you know, uh, value, which is basically uh, light and dark. But we need to focus on the three different color channels. And um, I'm usually starting with the red channel. I could start anywhere. And so looking at the red channel, this red line, uh, there's a couple of things I see in the histogram. Uh, I see this big bulb here, or this, this, this sort of hill. Uh, this is most of my image data. This is where most of my image values are. So the red tones or the cyan tones in my, uh, in my images. Then there's a very, very high peak here, which is kind of a fluke, but it's, it's the black mask. Uh, of the film holder that I was uh, using uh, to scan. So that's basically something we can ignore. These are the most extreme values that are sort of outside the image anyway. Uh, and then there's a little peak, which is nicely recognizable here. And this is the image base. This is the, um, uh, the film base. And we can actually sample that with the pipette tool uh, between the frames. See, it's right there. So this is this little peak that, that represents um, uh, the, the clear um, uh, the clear film between the frames and the clear film between the frames in the positive should become pitch black. This is actually a very reliable black point. So in adjusting the curves, I'm going to use that little peak um, to set the black point. So I'm going to drag that. And of course, I'm, you know, I set the black point, but now the entire red curve is at the bottom. So my entire image goes cyan. Yeah. Now I need to make a choice about the white point. And this is a lot trickier. And Departing from the image data that I have, I can see it's sort of this, this hill and the hill ends just about here. And this has an axe failure. You can actually see the axe failure is around 17 and a half or so. And what I generally do is I look, I look where 
uh, this, this sort of hill really slopes off into zero and then use that point approximately to set the white point. And I'm going to fine tune that later, but uh, let's use this as a starting point. So that's around 17 and a half or so. I don't want to overdo it. What I'm trying to do here is to sort of get approximately the right balance without lopping any information off of the highlights or the shadows, which is something that scanning software often does. Okay, so I've done this for the red channel. I'm going to do the same thing for the green channel. And uh, I still got this sample point here um, uh, at the end of you know, the, the, the space between the, between the frames. I can set the black point. And I'm going to set the white point for the green channel also where sort of where, where this hill ends. So it's around here, seven and a half or so. Uh, it's, around, it's around here. And as you can see, everything goes yellow. At this point, I ignore what happens to the image itself. You know, I'll figure that out later. I, you know, I know it'll sort itself. And, and you're gonna see that right now because I'm gonna do the, the final channel, the blue one. And you can also see that the blue one is the narrower channel. There's, there's, this is also why we scanned at 48-bit bit depth because if we had done this in 24-bit uh, uh, in or you know the same color space as, uh, as uh, JPEG, uh, we would get into trouble here with posterization. So uh, scanning at a high bit depth is really important if you're gonna do the inversions manually. Okay, so I'm gonna set the black point and then we're gonna set the white point probably somewhere around yeah, it's around six or so. Uh, that would be around here, maybe. And now what you can see sort of almost magically is that the color balance and all these images sort of falls into place. Um, and um, with properly processed negatives, this basically always happens. So you can take this sort of quasi raw positive scan uh, do this very simple linear adjustment on all the three channels and then it sort of you know, pops into place and there's not all that much adjustment that needs to be done uh, color wise. You may not be happy with the contrast at this point. For example, I find these all slightly light and maybe sort of, you know, um, they, they like a little punch, but technically everything is there. There's no important highlights lost. There's no shadows lost. Um, and the color balance, balance is approximately okay. This, by the way, is also the stage where I usually uh, take a break, go do something else, you know, just check the internet or check the email or something. Um, uh, because the, in order to fine tune the colors, uh, I do that by eye and uh, based on experience, but it's very easy. If you look at this for a long time, your eyes start to sort of bias. And um, it's very important to do the fine tuning after having a fresh look at the image. So look away for a bit and then look at it with fresh energy. Um, and looking at this, I think, you know, it's a little cool. I think probably the color balance is a little bit on the cool side on average, which is kind of, you know, sensible because most of these were shot under, you know, overcast conditions in the autumn. So, that's kind of drab light anyway. So maybe I will sort of adjust the blue channel a little bit and take out a little bit of the blue. Because if I take out blue, I'm gonna basically add yellow and that makes the images overall a little warmer. So I'm gonna depress the blue curve a little bit, just a little bit, because it's easy to overdo it. And probably something like this. But if I look at the sky in this image, I can also already see that if I overdo this, the sky will go green. So maybe actually I'm gonna leave it where it was because probably it's okay as it is. And maybe I should just, you know, work on the images individually from this point onwards. This is also why I said earlier, I wanna, you know, have several images in front of me at the same time, because if I do an adjustment and it doesn't work for all the images, at least I can see what I'm doing. Um, so this is probably an overall okay adjustment. And what I sometimes do at this point, and which is basically the final step um, before I start editing individual images, you know, if, if I want to do that, is I'm gonna go back to the you know overall curve and then maybe apply a little S curve to give them, you know, the images a little bit more punch. And an S curve basically means I'm gonna depress it, the shadows a little bit here. 
everything goes a little too dark now and I'm gonna lift the shadows or, or the highlights a little bit. So this is an S curve. And as you can see, that adds a lot of punch and actually it's a bit too much. So I'm gonna sort of make it a little bit more subtle. Right, something like this. And probably I'm, I'm just about there. Yeah, and this maybe, maybe I was touching the, the blue channel just now, but maybe I want to experiment a little bit with red and cyan. You know, cyan cast make Im makes images a little drab. Maybe if I add a little bit red. Yeah, maybe maybe if I do that, it improves a little bit, but I have to say that, you know, this this frame, for instance, gets a little pink. So this is also something I don't really want to overdo. So this is a pretty, I would say pretty acceptable, you know, average color balance that will work sort of okay. Um, so I'm going to hit okay and then uh, I'm, I'm done. I've color balanced all my frames and uh, uh, I can at this point save it. And that's what I usually do. I save this as sort of a quasi contact sheet. And I can, you know, cut off, cut out all the individual images and edit them and put them on the web or whatever. But usually this is where I'm, where I'm pretty happy with the result. All right, so having color balanced this one, um, I want to take this back to Andy again. And because this was my film and it's all very nice, but uh, Andy talked me into this. So let's have a look at uh, his negatives for a bit. And uh, he was doing a comparison between different uh, stocks of color negative film from Kodak. Um, this is a Kodak Actar on the top row, and then the middle row is Kodak Gold, and the bottom row is a Kodak Portra 160. And uh, uh, he shot this in medium format, so there are nice and wide film strips. And um, I know he that that he was shooting brackets on the left two frames, and then the right right frame is um, uh, part of another bracket experiment. Uh, and Andy was curious as to you know how do the colors relate between these different film stocks, and what kind of differences are there relative to each uh, to each other and um, you know color negative doesn't really have an absolute color balance you know you have to color balance that during printing or during scanning and then uh, uh, post-processing uh, but what we can tell is that um, how they relate to each other in a way and um, looking at these negatives I'm gonna you know do the same thing I did with my own negatives which is basically uh, take the curves and adjust the color, color uh, layers or the color channels uh, separately. Um, one thing I do note immediately is that um, these negatives look very, very dense. You know, if you compare them uh, to the ones I have, um, this is of course after they've been corrected, but if you look at this, is pretty, this is, these are all pretty light values. And if you look at Andy's strips, they're pretty dense. So I'm not really sure if that's something related to uh, the processing or how he exposed it or maybe his scanner or how he scanned it. I, I know that he scanned with similar settings that I uh, I just demonstrated with my Epson scanner. I think he uses the same scanner, uh, but there might be sort of a difference between uh, the, the individual scanners and the aging of the lamp or something like that. But this looks pretty dark and that might, I know that's going to, you know, make us run into a little bit of a challenge, but still let's see how far we get. Um, so I'm going to look at the curves and just do the, bit, the same thing I just did with my own film, which is I'm going to find the black point as well as the white point on each channel. And of course, notice that I'm looking for the peak at the bottom here and I've got sort of three distinct peaks, which is uh, uh, sensible because I've got three different film stocks. Um, let's look at uh, how they look in the raw version. You know, there's the, the Portra, which looks kind of green. Then there's Actar that looks uh, sort of brownish. And then there's a more orange uh, uh, Kodak Gold. Um, I, it's not exactly what I recognize from these film stocks. So I have a feeling that maybe uh, processing might play a role here as well. Um, but in any case, I know that if I want to set the black point on my curve channels, um, I will need to make a choice which, um, uh, well, which one of the three peaks at the bottom I'm going to choose. And I'm going to choose the, the one most at the bottom so I don't use a, lose any shadow detail any, anywhere. Um, then the white point, I just put that at the end of the image data basically, which is just around here. And then for the green channel, I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, set the black and set the white white point which is around here and I'm gonna do the blue channel 
which is around here. And this is where we run into the challenger or it really sort of becomes visible. Everything looks very, very bright. And um, well, of course, it's um, I just the negatives look very dark. So evidently the positives look very light. Um, again, why this is, I'm not really sure, but we need to correct for it a little bit uh, in order to, you know, uh, get some meaningful image data. So I'm just going to make everything overall a lot darker. There we go. And if I make it darker, I can also see the color balance a little bit easier. So it makes it easier to balance it out. And so this looks sort of, well, I've got a lot of shadow, maybe a bit like this. Something like this. What concerns me a little bit is that I think these highlights on this portrait roll, they're pretty, pretty bright. They're pretty close to white. I'm not really sure if we can sort of get enough meaningful in image data from there. Um, but for the example, it'll work well enough. And so having made everything darker, I can see that the color balance is definitely off on all strips of film. So. Uh, I would say mostly the green channel and the blue channel, or maybe it's cyan that I need to fix. Um, I have a feeling I should, well, maybe start with the red channel and put in a little bit more red. And I'm gonna just uh, shift the red point, the white point a little bit. Yeah, I'm not really happy with that because I'm gonna blow out these highlights. So that's not gonna work well. So I think I'll have to do nonlinear adjustments to get this right. Throw in, uh, just, Put in a little bit more red. And that brings the actor strip at least a little closer to where it should be. And interestingly, if I want to balance from this point on, I really have to make some choices because the actor definitely should not go much warmer. Uh, but the, you know, the portrait one at the bottom, uh, that's definitely still very, very blue. So if I'm going to try to fix that one, uh, I would take out some blue. That's maybe a little too much. Uh, take out a little blue, see if I can get a little bit more, more neutral. I still have a green cast going on, so I need to fix that as well. But this is at least for corrected more or less for the blue. You can actually see the actor the strip going very, very yellow. You notice I'm sort of skipping over the, the codec gold strip in the middle. It's not because I have anything against gold, but the, the contrast on these, uh, these the negatives in the middle is so different from the other ones. It's, you know, if I wanted to fix that, I'd have to really look, you know, look at that single film strip. So to make the comparison between these three different films, uh, in this particular case, I would just balance for the extremes, which is at the top of the bottom, and then just see where the gold in the middle ends up. Um, okay, so now I was twisting the blue channel to, to fix that bottom strip of portrait, and then of course the actor goes to yellow. So I'm gonna put that sort of, well, let's just put it back where it was. Uh, it's maybe too blue, right? You then see if I can fix the green, cast a little bit, and there it goes. There goes, you can actually see the, the, the actor strip, it goes pretty neutral, right? It's, uh, it's a bit desaturated, which is what you often get if you correct like this, uh, you get a very neutral color balance. And uh, if you print this optically, I know from experience, you get much, much printier, much more saturated colors. Uh, so this gives you sort of a middle of the road, uh, a sort of a, yeah, a quasi raw image that you can then, you know, adjust the taste later on. But I feel I've, I've sort of come close to uh, balancing the actor strip at least. Maybe take out a little bit blue. Nah, might go too warm. I think I'm gonna leave that where it is and maybe touch, touch up the red channel again. And yeah, might use a little bit more red. Nah, not too much. I think it's pretty, pretty close. Look at the green. That's probably fairly neutral. I think most of what remains now is overall density. Uh, so, especially for the actor strip, I could sort of pull the shadows even lower. I'm gonna lose that point altogether and just drag the entire curve down. But as you can see, then the portrait gets very, very dark. Um, 
So at this point, you know, for the comparison, I'm going to leave it here, uh, which would be okay. If you're going to balance these strips individually, you know, I would just, you know, uh, start with them individually, ignore the rest and just optimize for the strip you have at hand. All right, so this concludes this uh, illustration of how I color balance. Um, this is, of course, done on Andy's frames. I did the same thing on my own frames. Um, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's a very straightforward process. The only thing that is, of course, always challenging is to uh, sort of uh, judge color balance and um, uh, recognize when it's neutral or at least pleasing to your eye. Um, but, you know, even if you have little uh, um, uh, uh, deviations from, uh, from neutral, if you balance it the way I've just shown, uh, at least you get consistency throughout the images you balance at the same time. Uh, and of course, you can uh, always save a curve setting in GIMP or in Photoshop uh, and then recover that later on and use it on uh, images that you scan in the same way. And, you know, I, I really have to emphasize that uh, the scanning part was very important where I showed you to uh, scan as a quasi raw, you know, without any kind of automatic adjustment in the scanner software because it's very, very crucial in getting good consistency. And, um, you know, this is the way that works the best for me. And, uh, well, hopefully it's uh, of use to um, uh, anyone else as well. And um, of course, feel free to ask any questions and thanks for watching.